Welcome again to another episode of Big Ideas in App Architecture. I'm pleased to be joined today by Systems Engineering Fellow at Paycor, Adam Koch. Adam, welcome to the show. Very glad to have you. Uh, just like we have in past episodes, what I'm interested in hearing about from you first is a little bit about your background. How did you get started in this industry? How did you end up at Paycor? Tell us a little bit about Paycor, and then we'll uh, we'll see where it goes from there. But again, yeah. welcome to the show. I'll hit the rewind button for one second. You know, I started early. Um, you know, my mother worked actually for uh, Playnet, which was a uh, internet provider, online services provider for Commodore. Um, which, you know, eventually, you know, after a couple of moves became AOL. Um, so we had a computer in the house, you know, really early on. And, you know, between that machine and like a Sparrow bound uh, basic, you know, how to book, or whatever, um, you know, just got of got involved in computers a little bit early. Um, I got really lucky um, in my high school. Um, they did the cold green screen to Wintel, you know, Windows upgrade while I was there. And so we went from, you know, dealing with, you know, Apple, you know, first generation to Visual Studio um you know my junior year so um even though i you know still thought i wanted to be a doctor at that point took programming classes um really enjoyed it or whatever um i enrolled in the university of michigan thinking i was going to be a doctor went into pre-med and things like that oh really pre-med pre-med major huh yeah yeah and so i um you know took a 100 level computing course just because i wanted to do it for fun and i enjoyed it i really did not enjoy organic chemistry and so just things kept knocking and knocking and knocking. And I'm like, you know what? This is probably where I need to be. Um, I worked for the campus computer store. I did, um, you know, on-site computer service. You know, I was the computer guy uh, for a few years at the campus or whatever, doing all the faculty and Greek houses, computer stuff. And it kind of taught me to debug and diagnose everything that can go wrong with computer from A to Z. Um, but then, you know, leaving college, um, I got lucky and found a position over at Nielsen um, famous for their, the TV ratings, uh, working in their consumer packaged good research division um, down here in Covington, Kentucky. Um, you know, started uh, .NET development, you know, focusing on making their systems faster. Uh, they were a global company, so a lot of it was about delivering some of these applications um, to, you know, around the world, uh, you know, especially large reports at a time when um, internet <laughs> wasn't the best and things like that. So offline background copying and things like that. And, you know, um, with us being an in-house development team for like kind of their HR and financial services, effectively every couple of months, there'd be some new problem that we had to solve for. Um, so it was just, it was interesting, you know, being thrown different problems at different times. It was kind of that desktop, uh, desktop to um, web, you know, kind of, uh, transition or whatever. Um, and I just got in at a really lucky time. So um, pretty much at some point they decided to stop uh, focusing on in-house software and wanted to convert everything into SAP. Um, so I went to a recruiter and two weeks later I landed at Paycor. Um, I started there as a dev two and kind of went up from there. Um, you know, Paycor is a, you know, HCM provider. So uh, they, when I joined, um, was a small handful of developers working on three or four systems, largely desktop based. Um, and it was interesting, you know, they kind of had this era where they tried to fake the web um, through like Citrix uh, remote desktop based software. Um, those were fun days. I remember yeah, those days. It was better than, you know, uh, mailing out CD-ROMs and things like that. But, you know, it definitely was not the, the, the web experience. And so uh, I kind of got in at a really good time. Um, they were just spinning up their next generation web delivered uh, payroll HCM solution. And so I was on for the ground floor of that. And that was, yeah. And, and Adam, I mean, everybody listening to this may know this acronym and maybe I should know this acronym as well. But HCM stands for what? human capital management. So effectively thinking, and it sounds kind of bad, but, you know, thinking of, you know, humans as, you know, a, a resource that you have to manage, you know, a lot of people's um, major spend in an organization is on their people. Uh, their success is driven by their people. And so it's, it's really about getting the most um, out of your workers as possible. So. Yeah. So, and you've been, you've been at Paycor for about 12 years. Is that right? Yeah. 2011. So, I, I mean, you've seen all sorts of change, I would imagine there. I mean, you know, you were kind of hinting at some of the the change that that's happened from a technology perspective. Uh, but also, you know, your roles and responsibilities have changed. I mean, I guess, you know, kind of tell us or, or tell me, you know, systems engineering fellows, kind of where you are right now. What's your kind of what's your domain? What's your sure. 
you know, what, what are you doing for Paycor in that, in that capacity and role? Yeah. So, you know, I came up through Paycor as a developer working on originally our, you know, single sign on because, you know, when I first started, uh, we had three or four passwords to use our suite. And, and, and that by today's standards is crazy. You know, if anything, you want to have one ID that's not even um, from Paycor. You want to have a third party identity provider. But, you know, we brought everything together there. Then it was, you know, as we acquired software, you know, could we effectively have all that be a single source of truth because you don't want to enter your data twice. Um, there was systems where, um, again, you know, we wanted to go from uh, desktop to kind of pseudo web to web. And when I say pseudo web, you know, we got on right when Flash and Silverlight was at its height. Um, so we designed an entire product around Silverlight, which was beautiful. Um, but you know, when the web browsers decided not to support you know those SDKs anymore, we had to quickly move over to a more you know native uh, web experience and things like that. And so it's been a journey. Um, you know as through all of that, Paycor kind of realized that, you know, it was growing really fast and that if it didn't focus on some of its fundamental architecture, um, that it wasn't going to be able to scale. And that's everything from like data architecture to uh, moving from a data center based you know, process to the cloud. Um, you know, things about having, you know, contracts between the systems that weren't at the database level. We wanted to move up to, you know, RESTful services and things like that. Um, they, we wanted events to propagate, you know, employees being hired, employees being terminated, payrolls being run. So that way people didn't have to pull, you know, database tables anymore. You know, it's just a, a, the classic kind of evolution of software. It just happened very, very quickly because, um, you know, Paycor always had a great product, a great customer service, and with that came a large increase in user population year over year. And so every year, simply just to keep ourselves afloat, we had to innovate and we had to you know scale our system. So, yeah, and I think that's one of the one of the reasons I, I, I think the conversation you and I kind of started earlier in the week, and hopefully we'll have today, is really an interesting one for me because you know in, in the podcast we've had, and, and certainly. You know, in, in my couple of years with Cockroach, I had the opportunity to talk to all sorts of folks from different backgrounds and, and, and different types of industries for sure. But, you know, people in, 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 you know, different size companies have been there, you know, from the very beginning or, you know, have just joined a company or started a company. You know, what I think is really interesting about your background is here you've been with Paycall for 12 years, really gotten to see, you know, a front row seat at some really dramatic changes in the industry, right? And I think, you know, you can speak to, and hopefully we'll get in today, some of those, some of the real challenges of, of taking an organization, you know, their infrastructure, their IT, their, you know, their bread and butter in some ways, and kind of, you know, massaging it, shaping it, helping it grow and change, you know, as the industry has really radically changed. I mean, as you mentioned, things like Flash, you know, as a way to deliver technology, you know, we don't think about that these days. Nobody goes out there and says, hey, I'd love to go build a real flash app. But, you know, working with a company through that entire journey, I think, is is really a fascinating perspective, one that we don't get a lot. I mean, people, especially today, you know, they're jumping around a lot. I mean, you know, they're at a company for a year or two and, and then move on. I think 12 years and seeing all that is is really, really interesting. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, one of the reasons I'm still with Paycor is that because it's grown and innovated itself, there's been opportunities here. You know, normally, if you wanted to do distributed systems, if you wanted to do a different delivery platform, if you wanted to go to multiple clouds and things like that, you may have to, you know, do tours of duty at different companies. And, you know, for example, we've taken a multi-cloud approach uh, between uh, wanting to diversify, um, acquisitions, you know, landing with whatever technology set it is. Um, and th those have opened up, you know, opportunities for myself and my coworkers to, you know, effectively stay, you know, cutting edge. You know, usually a lot of times when you interview someone who's worked somewhere for 10 years, they've done the same job for 10 years. You know, it's the same one year, 10 years in a row. And it's really great, um, you know, that we have the right people that want to effectively rethink what we're doing every three to four years. Well, so, so the cloud is an interesting topic. And I wonder if that's one we could get into just a little bit, because I think, um, you know, obviously... It, to say it's all the rage is probably an understatement. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I think every company on the planet is either made that transition or thinking about it or in the middle of it, I suppose, yeah. you know, being there 12 years, you've got, you, you know, you, you've seen it all. I mean, what's been the, you know, you don't have to get into to all the, the, the dirty secrets and details, but, yeah. you know, maybe talk, talk through a little bit about, you know, what it was like for you and your teams kind of transitioning, if you will, mm -hmm. um, from, you know, older legacy kind of systems and approaches to, to the cloud, because the cloud offers a lot of stuff. 
Yeah. And so, you know, um, you've probably heard this from people, but there's the cloud done wrong and there's the cloud done right. You know, you know, um, you know, you can have VMs in the data center just as easily as you can have VMs in Azure and AWS and Google. Um, what it really comes down to is, is it affecting your business, business agility? You know, can you scale? Can you effectively, you know, cost shape your stuff and, you know, not have a, you know, a really high burn rate? And so what we did is we went on a journey, you know, effectively we start out in the cloud because we have a time product and there's this whole idea that you cannot not be able to punch, um, you know, whether it's, you know, three o'clock, five o'clock, 1 a.m., you know, everyone's punching in and punching out at some point. And we wanted to have, you know, a three or four nines um, ability for people to be able to punch in. And so we just said, let's be cloud first. You know, at that point, um, the world was a little more uh, IaaS, you know, so we were kind of building what would be almost like a server out in the cloud. Um, but one of the major pivots that we've made is moving into platforms as a service and then moving from platforms as a service into serverless. You know, what we want to do is we kind of want to abstract ourselves away from, you know, having to do anything with OS patching because if you have you ever been through an OS patching cycle it, it can take down your company for months uh, to you know, certify old applications that don't have to test automation and things like that um, so that, 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 yeah, that, that's the benefit. We partnered effectively the cloud move, which is like, you know, everyone's doing the cloud with a really strong um, CI CD platform. We, we have a wonderful, what we call, you know, DevOps team here. Um, and, you know, we misuse the term slightly because it's effectively the tools that enable DevOps, we call DevOps. Um, but effectively, you know, we can self-service an application all the way from, uh, you give it a name, you give it a scale size, you give it a code, is it, you know, new or, um, Node is it you know .dot net whatever, uh, and we effectively can in you know a couple of minutes get you a, a test environment. Once you certify that, in a few minutes we can be in production, and uh, that has really been what has allowed us to adopt the cloud well and quickly is using you know platforms as a service. You know we effectively say punch from a list. Do you want an application? Do you want to write us cache? Do you want a queue? Um, do you want it to be multi-region? You know, one of the, I think topics that your guests have talked about is resiliency and things like that. We definitely have to make sure that everything we build um, can be up, you know, the three nines plus or whatever. Uh, it, you're misusing the cloud if you're not doing multi-region availability regions and things like that because, yeah, you're saving some money, but, you know, the cloud, everyone tells you is designed to go down periodically. You know, they cannot keep it up any better than any other server in the world. And if anything, it's shared infrastructure, you know, so there's a lot of load on it. And so, yeah, yeah. so I, I think it's half of us, you know, going to the cloud, which is again, check the box, but half of it is us doing it really um, well, especially every year we kind of get back to it to the point where we're taking our first generation cloud products and moving them into our latest kind of uh, cloud paradigm. So that way we can end of life the first generation cloud as much as we can end up life our data center operations. Now, now some of this infrastructure, because I think this is where people really get stuck sometimes mm -hmm. is kind of that infrastructure as code or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever you want to call it. Now, was this stuff you guys built at home? Is yeah. this, you know, you're using some of the big brands out there, a little combination of both, you know, yeah, I don't know what you can and can't or would share, but I'm just oh, curious, like, yeah. how did this evolve sure, and what's yeah. it, what's it look like today? Yeah. So I get asked both by people we interview and people who join the organization, like, Oh, Terraform exists. Why aren't you using Terraform? Yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, Azure has like Bicep and there's like CDK and different things over in AWS. It's like, if things exist, why, why are you doing anything yourself? Effectively, what we did is we put a usability layer around everything. And we said, hey, you know that you need an app. You know that you needed to scale. You needed to have an OAuth identity. You needed to have um, access to certain key value pairs for configuration management. That's all we ask you. And then everything else is abstracted. We haven't had to really pivot the next layer down of what we actually spin up just because, you know, Azure tends to be backwards compatible, you know, for a period of time and things like that. But largely, when you give us those directives, we can create everything you need. Um, a lot of things, um, if you look at this documentation, they're like, oh, well, first create this container, then put something in the container, then put a load balancer in front of the container. And the thing is, so like what seems like a really simple application ends up being five or six steps. We have abstracted all of that. And if nothing else, it forces compliance. You know, um, one of my big things is like, you can tell people over all day long, here's our standards, do it with this naming convention, doing with the whatever. And so we at the front door get you to name things properly, size it properly. You know, we only give you a white list of what you should be using and things like that. And then worst case is if we ever make a mistake because, you know, humans are fallible, we have everyone doing the same wrong thing and then we can upgrade everyone at the same time versus having kind of you know, sprawl of different technologies in different places and things like that. And, you know, just out of curiosity, you know, because you kind of hinted at it in a couple of ways. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 
certainly, you know, this idea of OS upgrades, you know, potentially mm -hmm. taking, taking things down. I mean, you know, this approach that y'all have taken, and, and to me sounds like, you know, you've really refined over the years. I mean, what, what has this meant to pay core? You know, and yeah. I, I don't mean, to, I don't mean, you know, put it in dollar figures, but I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, like obviously, mm -hmm. obviously you have an advanced way of, of mm -hmm. provisioning and deploying assets. I, I would imagine, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would imagine this is actually quite useful and beneficial. Yes. But I, I'm just curious how, how you and others think about kind of the investment you've made here. Yeah, and so I won't pretend that for a, a, a sufficiently complex application that it's not going to take you know weeks, months to get something out the door because you know there, there's complex business rules, there's testing and all those things. But the idea here is to effectively say the floor of getting something out the door. A, be, a good example is um, during COVID, there was this concept of a PPP loan, uh, payroll protection plan or whatever. Um, and what happened was there was going to be a really small window where the government was going to allow you to say, hey, I have this many employees, uh, here's two months worth of salary cost. And they were effectively going to give you a loan, which could be forgiven um, if you know everything kind of fell into place. And we were able to, within a week, get a UI, a data extract set up. So if you're a customer, you effectively uh, picked which, because different people have uh, more than one business unit with us, like a franchise of restaurants and things like that. Um, you had to pick uh, your business, hit a button, and we dumped all the data that you needed to fill out that form in a couple seconds. And so we believe that the people who you know effectively did that process got in front of the line for those loans, which ran out of funds um, pretty quickly. They did have a, a second funding cycle, but the idea that we were able to put that in our customers' hands, we had all their data because they've been running payroll with us. Uh, we just had to make it accessible. And the technology, um, both from um, our infrastructure as code, we have things like reusable UI uh, components. We have a pretty standardized tech stack pattern or whatever. So really all it came down to was the person writing the data extract had to put that in there. Um, and that was it. Now, um you, you happen to mention a few times there, kind of my four or my favorite four letter word, which is data. Um, you know, obviously, and I know this, you know, I could guess this, but I also know from talking to you, I mean, you know, Paycor is a big company, you know, grown certainly through acquisition. I'm sure there's, you know, lots of data in lots of places um, and probably lots of technologies at play. I mean, can, and again, I, what I think is so fascinating about about kind of your experience is, you know, you're there from, you know, very early days, and have probably observed, and 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 correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to assume too much here, but you know, observed. I think, um, you know, how like for example, data architecture has evolved in the last you know ten to fifteen years from traditional relational systems to NoSQL and and document stores, and then all of a sudden we got into big data and Hadoop, uh, you know, and then. And then, of course, the world that, you know, that I occupy today, which is going to new SQL, distributed SQL, you know, you've probably you've probably dabbled in all of it. Um, you know, just curious a little bit about kind of how how the data infrastructure, you know, and tooling uh, has changed or how you've you know, how you've observed it changing over the years. Yeah, it's definitely evolved. You know, early days, um, you had a transactional database system, and the way reporting worked is you pointed a report system to the transactional data <laughs> yeah. system, and you yeah. very carefully tried to run a big report. You know, that 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 was that was the early days. Then screamed at people when they when yeah. they you know swamped your system. I remember that. Yeah, and then there was you know some basic phases of like, oh, we should have a copy of the data over here, so that way that's a read intent, and then we have our transactional read write system over here. And again, like that, you know, step step step. Um, then we got to points where people didn't want. Oh, this is to be very clear. Some business people, all they want is literally a database in Excel format, and we try and figure out how to manage that. Um, but you know, other people want business insights. They want to know what was my salary for the month, what was my um, you know time off patterns. Is there people who are missing work on a consistent, you know, recurring basis? So more insights. You know, so not, even if it's still you know classic database based, trying to figure out you know what sort of insightful database um, patterns you know can we provide to our people. Abstracting all, all that you know, of course, to you know visualizations and reports and widgets and things like that. And then you, you touched on it, you know, there's a whole concept of big data, you know, when we think about it, you know, we have, in a lot of cases, seven years of our customers data, uh, every, you know, punch, all these you know, pay stubs that we've run, performance reviews and things like that, you know, what answers, you know, can we get out of those things? Um, you know, with cloud scale, there's no longer a limit on, you know, how many bytes you can store it. You may store it two or three different times in different shapes or whatever. Um, you know, we've leveraged Snowflake because in some cases, you know, one of my big favorite things is let a vendor, let a tool completely 
you know, remove a workload off of you because, you know, in some cases, you know, because we have, you know, PhDs, you know, working on some of these things, we can't do that one thing better than they're doing. So we, then we effectively reinvest that time we saved back into our business layer, um, making sure that we can make things usable, supportable, uh, the data quality is there because, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Um, but yeah, you know, at this point, the intention is cloud scale data, both from a uh, horizontally scalable um, transactional system, um, having real-time events, you know, so that way if you need to know about something a moment later, um, to be able to have uh, both for ourselves and our partners, our third-party partners, and then of course to reporting system, all of those things within good SLAs. So, you know, we're not reinventing the world. The major thing is, is that to effectively put that customer service layer around everything that makes it usable. Because, you know, ultimately, you know, a lot of our customers are, say, a four-person pizza shop or whatever. And we want to be able to make it as accessible to them as someone who might have a data team, you know, every once in a while. Someone will reach out to us because they want to do a Tableau. They want to do, you know, some sort of, you know, Power BI on their side. And we'll, we'll, we want to enable that. But at the same time, a lot of our customers just want the answers. They don't want to have necessarily inspection into the actual underlying system. So, you know, just going back into kind of some of the data stuff, um, you know, in, in terms of um, architecture, size, I mean, can we t talk a little bit? And, 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 you know, another topic I want to touch on with you, because I, I think it's it's interesting. And again, we, we talk to so many companies who who have dealt with this. It's just kind of growth through acquisition and, you know, kind of um, what's the term I'm looking for? Kind of onboarding, you know, not only not only people, uh, but technology and data. Just just kind of curious to, to hear a little bit more about kind of how you've tackled tackled some of those challenges and what, you know, what ultimately the tools you mentioned snowflake, I'm sure there are others. I mean, what are, what are some of the, the kind of the core pieces of that, that data infrastructure? Yeah. And, and so, you know, um, even though we are classically a, a Microsoft SQL shop, um, we, we've acquired people who were like say pre Aurora, you know, relational database in AWS. Um, some people, you know, Mongo and things like that. The, the major thing is, is that of course, you know, um, everyone tries to achieve a certain, you know, uh, domain driven design or whatever. And as we acquire a domain, they're already separate. They're already, you know, adhering to those boundaries and things like that. And so the best we can do is maintain those. Uh, the things that they're missing are our master data, our authentication, our security policies, our you know, navigation and things like that. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to provide those teams with the onboarding um, toolkit. And we're obviously constantly evolving this. Um, so that way, you know, within, you know, say a small period of time, don't want to quote any numbers, um, that we can effectively say, hey, one way to, uh, syncing of all the master data, all of their insights come back into our reporting platform, authentication works both ways and things like that. Um, because, you know, uh, honestly, one of our first acquisitions, you know, it took us, you know, months, if not years uh, to really make it uh, work properly. And now, you know, we're in a matter of days, you know, the intention there. And it really comes down to effectively, um, you know, where they're at. You know, some people have um, done partnerships and integrations as part of their business. Some people were a startup and, and really all they did is had their own authentication identity provider. And they just kind of had to learn to integrate uh, as part of the acquisition pipeline. But, um, but yeah. So that's it. You know, that's it kind of brings me to another, I think, fascinating topic, which we've talked to other folks about, and you know, and it's, it's really around, I think, broadly lessons learned. So, you know, you kind of hinted at one, like, Hey, you know, first time we did this, it took years. Now we've got it, you know, down to a, down to a science. I mean, what are some of the things that, you know, and again, talk only what you're comfortable talking about, but you know, I mean, what are some of those like lessons learned, uh, you know, having, having again, this front row seat at, at some pretty big changes, I think in a company, you know, where, you know, you've maybe you've made some, you know, poor technology decisions or architecture decisions, not necessarily the time, but in, you know, in the rear view mirror, you're like, ah, oh, geez, I wish we would have tackled this or done this differently. I, I, maybe there aren't any. Yeah. But well, I, I'm just curious what, uh, what so, your thoughts are. You know, there. one of the funny things, depending on your journey in, in technology is like, hey, we want them to feel like they're part of our, you know, application suite or whatever. So yeah. style sheets, you know, that, that was a thing. Or, you know what, uh, let's go ahead and just throw our banner across the top of their uh, application. Um, let's put them in an iframe. You know what? We don't have time. Oh, really yeah. Pay, you know? Yeah, iframes. Yeah. Uh, that, that was a thing. Um, 
And really, um, you know, our focus on our UI framework has been a lot of React components and things like that. We, we dabbled in some of the more classic, you know, web components or whatever, uh, but we really kind of centered around some of the React stuff. And the idea there is, is that, you know, um, we've been lucky. You know, a lot of our uh, acquisitions have been React based. And so you can provide them with things like navigation bars and modals and chat pop-ups and things like that. Things that all of a sudden immediately you know, um, kind of give them a toolkit almost to, to, to come online with us. Um, you know, in some cases, you know, we just have to rationalize the fact that they've done some of the same things as us and, you know, which one wins. And, you know, the reason we're acquiring them is a lot of times they win, um, you know, the, the arms race as far as features and things like that. But, um, yeah, and, and then, you know, at the cloud scale, you know, uh, you know, pushing around, you know, a lot of data at the start to kind of simulate, you know, how things should be uh, is not off the table. And then obviously we, um, you know, we correct that and have true sources of truth and, you know, um, things like that. But, you know, I would say that overall, um, you know, the intention is that we want to make sure it's a stable experience. We want to, you know, have it be a very usable experience. And then as, um, things kind of fall into place, you know, we kind of smooth the, the engineering edges off of the thing, going back to the whole uh, you know, infrastructure as code serverless kind of movement and things like that, you know, as uh, time allows. A lot of the folks we talk to and a lot of the businesses we interact with, I mean, downtime, you know, we talked a little bit about, or you've mentioned, you know, resiliency and, um, you know, certainly multi-region plays into this, but, you know, downtime can be a, a big burden to people. Uh, you know, one of you know, you can imagine different industries where downtime can cost, you know, any moment, you know, minutes of downtime can cost millions of dollars. You know, what, what does that kind of stuff mean for Paycor, you know, and Paycor's customers? Is it, do you feel like, you know, that is a huge issue? Do you guys have very stringent SLAs? I mean, just kind of curious kind of what the, kind of what the approach is there. Yeah, the way we look at it is, is when we're down, um, people either can't punch in, can't punch out. Uh, they can't process their payrolls. And if you're not familiar how our ACH system works in America, um, you can't, it's, it's not instant. You know, um, you a lot of times have to, you know, tell people that whether they're going to get paid on Wednesday so it can be in their um, accounts by Friday. You know, there's, you know, modernization kind of working its way through the banking system, but, you know, a lot of things are still run off of very old processes that effectively have to have a couple of day lead time to get things paid. And so if someone can't do their payroll the day that they're expecting to, checks may be late. And of course, you know, um, a lot of people like their check being a day late means a lot of problems in, in their lives and things a like that. A lot of problems. I can attest um, to this. Yeah. You know, um, there's situations where um, we are on the, the, the hiring side, you know, um, you know, making sure that people um, can get people in the door. You know, we have, you know, a lot of different struggles lately uh, keeping places staffed. And so if we are in the way of that stuff, so we treat it very seriously as far as, you know, can people get into our system? Is it up? Um, you know, like you mentioned, we use everything from like multi-region to kind of failure modes and things like that. Like, you know, if we can't get you uh, maybe some of the insights that we're trying to deliver to you, we still let you punch. We still let you um, access um, like emergency phone numbers and things like that. Um, our, hope, our intention is, is, is hope is that we effectively can give you the full experience um, most of the time. But we take it you know very seriously um, what we do there. Uh, and then, of course, our stuff is delivered you know, web, mobile. Uh, we have things like time clocks and things like that. So if you log lost your internet um, at your facility, it just um, sends it up when your internet's restored and things like that, trying to make sure that, you know, the whole process of having to walk over to your manager and say, hey, I punched in at nine o'clock, but it wasn't working, whatever, that adds a bunch of time and effort to, you know, a, a working manager schedule that they don't need to deal with, so. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. A whole factory floor of people or something like that yeah, saying, Hey, yeah. I, you know, I, I tried to punch it. Yeah. It could get if off you're the a, pretty quickly. Supermarket when the power goes out, they're not yeah. looking to ring people up by paper, you know? Yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's not good. And I didn't realize that. I mean, maybe I should have about uh, the payroll system that, that it was kind of, there were so many hard and fast rules. Like if you don't get, you don't get it in on time. So if your systems go down the night that that's supposed to happen, that could, that could cause big, big issues. Um, one other thing I wanted to, to kind of get your perspective on, um, and we talked a little bit about it is, is kind of building teams, you know, uh, you know, engineering teams, uh, and, and other teams, obviously you've been a part at, at Paycor of a number of different teams and, you know, see the organization grow. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously all the, the tech skills required to be, you know, to be a good engineer, but there's a lot of like soft skills, you know, that are important too. Just kind of curious about about your perspective and, and and thinking on you know obviously we've been talking a lot about about tech but you know it's not that's not the only 
part of the equation, I, I don't think. Yeah, well, you know, we've gone through the journey of establishing an architecture team, establishing an architecture practice, you know, what is EA, you know, versus what is application architecture versus what is data architecture. You know, I believe that there's a, there's a certain assumption that as soon as you wrote it down, it was gospel and it would just happen. You know, um, hey, this is the naming standard. This is a scaling standard. Um, everything should be done with versioned APIs or whatever. And really, um, there's a few things wrong with that kind of presumption. You know, one, you have to establish the patterns and standards. And luckily, there's enough kind of um, you know, de facto things out there that you can kind of you know, leverage off of those. You have to write them down, you know, and there's a million tools out there for, for, for progressing it out there. But one of the things that, again, even if you have a wiki, even if you have a good um, you know, EA tool or things like that, is kind of the hearts and minds. You know, why are we doing this? You know, if you've ever been someplace where they start agile for the first time, you've been somewhere where they did like um, unit testing for the first time, you know, it's amazing. Um, you'll go to a conference and you'll see this thing and you come away from like, oh my God, we're going to do this. And people share the last slide. They share, this is the mountaintop or whatever. And you sat through an hour and a half about why you're doing it. And you're trying to get convince everyone else with the final slide of this, th this is the promised land. And I think if you take teams through it, like, you know, we talk about the delivery of applications kind of like through the CICD platform, trying to tell people like, hey, um, test automation is important, not for correctness. It's like, oh, what? You know, of course we want to be correct. Test automation is important for uh, reducing your cycle time to get things out to production. Um, and I think people started clicking while we were doing that because a manual tester can find the bugs over the course of three or four days, the, it, probably better than an automation can. But the, what the automation can do is it can find 99% of the problems and get you out in a couple hours. And then, yes, we will have, uh, you know, point, you know, 1%, you know, kind of release um, defects or whatever. But we have a fast rollback strategy. You have the whole blue green, you know, circle deployments and things like that. And that helps your business agility, you know, um, you know, independent of your tech stack and things like that. Um, and what I found is, is two things. One, having the culture of getting that information out to people, you know, what we got to do and why we have to do it but then also making sure that you translate that up to the non-technical uh, folks, because it can seem like, I, I don't know how many times that I've been stopped and say, hey, you guys are doing insert technology, going to cloud, you know, using a cache. It's just it's simple, you know, bread and butter things just because it's cool. You know, we just created a, a Silverlight UI. We just created a, you know, an Angular or a Knockback JS, whatever. And now you're saying we want to go to React. It's just because it's cool, isn't it? You know, like, well, no, like, you know, we think that the reusability is there, that the, the, the training, the community, the Stack Overflow answers are there. Like, there's a million reasons that we're doing what we're doing. Apparently, I didn't convey it to you well enough. And so um, for me, you talk about the, the, the soft skills, it is showing your work. You know, why are we doing what we're doing? And I think one of the things that's completely fair is people say, well, can you measure it? Can you do this better thing and show it? And like, there's some things are clear, like our deployment pipeline, it went from, you know, months down to weeks, down to hours, down to minutes or whatever. So clear, clear improvement. When it comes to some of the more application dev cycle stuff, it's a little bit harder because every piece of work is different. A deployment is a deployment. It's bits to a server. Uh, when it comes to building three different tools for different areas of the payroll, HR kind of, um, you know, domain, uh, you know, a simple dashboard versus um, responding to a new law are just very different things. And so, oh, hey, <laughs> you know, this is 10% faster, is it? You know, um, but I, I do respect um, both of those things. One. Why are we doing this? And then two, proved me that it's better. Because I think that one of the reasons I'm in technology is that things are usually provably better. Like this iPhone's faster than this iPhone. 4G is faster than 3G. Like I like someone calling me out and saying, show me that this is better. Because usually there's a way to do it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really fascinating. And I, I think one of the things that I've observed, you know, in working with various companies is, and, and you kind of really touched on it, is change is hard. You know, and if you're not communicating, you know, effectively, uh, it, it can be enormously difficult. And I think this is very true in technology, you know, especially again on the vendor side, we're out there selling, you know, a database technology, which is, you know, which is new and different and, and sometimes scary, um, or at least I think people, you know, think it's so, you know, and the hardest part about, for example, adopting a new database oftentimes isn't actually you know, the, the data migration, the kind of the physical work you have to do, it's just winning the hearts and minds of people. It's getting people accustomed, you know, to doing something different and, and, you know, adopting change. And I think, 
you know, again, that's probably something you've seen time and time again play out, you know, uh, over the years is that, and I'm sure there are at Paycor is there, they've been everywhere. You know, there's somebody in the corner that says, oh, you know, that's not how, yeah, that's not well, how we're, you know, we're supposed to do it here. And yeah. What, what, why, why do we need JSON XML is fine. Why do we need YAML? JSON? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. don't need that new fangled. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And I, and I think, you know, the data platform is, is, is a good place because honestly applications can come and go, you know, you could completely yeah. do your mobile app in three stacks. The data is probably still the same data, you know, honestly, uh, you know, you go from a, you know, managed or a, you know, self-managed instance to a, you know, vendor managed instance to a, you know, serverless instance, whatever. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, the other conversation kind of cloud scale data stuff or whatever and honestly like you know is your business ready for no sequel you know uh and obviously that that's kind of nebulous you know are you ready for you know document storage are you ready for you know um changing how your data is not all in one place anymore you know uh as you go through kind of iterations of vertical scale there's a certain way you can design your system as soon as you horizontally scale all of a sudden you know you talk about snowflake and things like that you know how do you bring everything together at the last moment while you know making sure that you have true horizontal scale um you know i think there's there's some exciting things happening um you know with uh, again i said before i want vendors to solve some core fundamental problem you know with our things because uh you know engineers i think largely want to turn on something and use it you know um i you know Blob storage has been around for a decade, but it still, you know, obviously blows some people's minds that, you know, you have terabytes, petabytes of, you know, storage space available to you when that used to be a big thing. Like, you know, oh, you know, our fiscal year is about to end. Can you wait three more months just to get more disk? Like, you know, business agility around those kind of, um, you, know, uh, you know, lead times, runways is just crazy. You know, you know I always will defend the cloud in you know, two major ways. You want something, you acquire them today, are you really going to wait, you know, three, six months to onboard them when we have the, the stuff to attach them to? Uh, and then the resiliency, you know, right now, um, you know, data centers have to have two data centers. You have to have two redundant things existing. Um, maybe you have active, active, but generally you just have to rack things twice. With the cloud, you could have 90, 10, 50, 50. You have, you know, what you need in both places and, you know, the world effectively is your, your backup strategy or whatever. So. Yeah, that certainly, I mean, that, that touches nerve with the cockroach folks. I mean, you know, it's like data everywhere, never go down, you know, kind of data survive, architecture databases survive everything. Um, and it's important. One other thing I, I wanted to touch on with you, because is again, we, we talked about it briefly before, but I think it's it's kind of a nice segue. And that is the relationship between kind of engineering and product teams. You know, I know it's not necessarily, at, you know, a big idea in app architecture, but I mean, you know, the reality is, you know, those two teams functioning well is a super, super important thing. Not only is your, you know, building a SaaS business like, like Cockroach is, but, you know, even at Paycor where, um, you know, you've been doing things a long time. I mean, can you talk a little bit about how that, you know, how that functions at Paycor and, and, you know, what you've seen work well, maybe not so well, how it's changed over time, all those kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest things is, is, you know, obviously like any company that sells to customers, um, B2C is, you know, we have customer facing product people who understands the market, understands the business problems, you know, constantly evolving, um, you know, what we're delivering to our customers. And in one of the, you know, not quite epiphanies, but one of the big realizations was, we have to have internal products, you know, you know, a sufficiently large companies, authentication, storage, messaging, and things like that. Like I want to write an app that can send an email, an SMS, can raise a, a toast message in an application. And I don't want to write code for that. I just want to hook into the Paycor way of doing that. And I think that's one of the biggest things we've done at kind of the macro level is we have product owners over those things. Their customers are the internal engineering teams. They understand, you know, what their needs are. Will a simple MVI work? Does it have to be a robust offering in order to really service them? Um, those sorts of things. And then the next thing is, is, you know, so that's kind of the abstract macro stuff. You know, we talked about patterns and things like that. Like, okay, you know, you want to go from a single connection string to um, either you know, a magic, you know, data offering in the cloud, or you want to go to something that's a little bit more, you know, managed um, sharding or something like that. And okay, well, that sounds like work that's going to take away time from our customer delivered features or whatever. Um, there's this new way that we want to be able to support uh, unions in California. There's a new thing that we want to do that supports, you know, specifically healthcare or manufacturing or whatever. Um, we're, we're not going to be able to do that because we're working on your stuff. Um, and I think you know, explaining to people, you know, what we're doing, you know, one thing is, is that Paycor has a very good problem. 
we're, we're a very high growth company. Uh, the problem is, is that, you know, when you see things, you know, going up and to the right, we have to have uh, systems that can support that all the way down because, you know, we talk about the weakest link and things like that. If, um, you know, your authentication doesn't work, if the, the file storage underneath something doesn't work, if, you know, um, the menu um, doesn't work, you know, people can't see, you know, which products they have and, and navigate the solution. Um, so making sure that the engineers can explain to their product owners, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, why this investment's, you know, ready now, you know, I, I use examples sometime of like, you know, going from like a flip phone to a smartphone, you know, you didn't really have to, uh, sell people on it once they saw it, they knew it, you know, sometimes things aren't as easy as that, you know, sometimes it's like your furnace is on its last leg. Is it? It's still blowing hot air. You know, I don't quite know what you mean by it's almost dead. Yeah. You know, it sounds like it's still working. Um, and so, yeah, and, and so, you know, um, the, the strongest teams at Paycor that I've seen have built trust. Effectively, you know, we used to try and, again, going back to the, you know, stake it to the wall and it's the rule, uh, you know, 20% of your time needs to be spent on just, you know, clearly stuff. And then the first feedback is, well, if it's always 20%, what if I need less than 20%? It feels like I'm wasting it. I'm leaving, you know, time on the table. And that's, you know, again, that, that does not work. What you can say is, is that, like, if something's going to affect your customer now or impact your customer in 90 days, you know, whatever, and it's going to take, say, 60 days to fix it, well, you shouldn't wait <laughs> until it's broken, until it's, you know, slower than we want it to be, um, and, until you address it and things like that. And again, the the best teams are the ones who have built that 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 trust. The other thing, you know, I heard hear terms like gold plating, like, oh, you're going to build it, but you're going to build it so cool and using the latest technologies and whatever. It's like, well, no, like if I bring a new data platform in, it's to solve a problem. If I bring um, a new uh, type of compute, because, you know, over the years we've changed, for example, in Azure, the, the type of um, host that we've targeted and each one brought something to the table. It wasn't like, oh, this is cool. It was more like, hey, do you realize that this auto scales? Do you realize um, that this uh, takes away the need of having to have like a V? VPN or just you know, something about the prior solution um, that, you know, we can accept. You know, to. it's funny, I, this term gold plating, I've not heard. Is it, is it, <laughs> that, is that kind of analogous to like putting lipstick on a pig? I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, the, the, there's different fr fr um, phrases that have been used. But ultimately, the idea is, is imagine if you gave an engineer unlimited time. Um, they would add every library, every automation, every extensibility thing, whatever. And ultimately, and you know, this is nothing that we invented. It's like, get something to production as quickly as possible. Have a few beta users tell it. They're going to tell you pretty quickly if it's landing the mark or whatever you know um we did kind of a you know lean startup methodology a while back if you remember the book um the intention there is you know like again you're gonna learn a lot more by having software in customers hands than by doing things and um the other thing and we talk about your know, reusable modules and patterns and things like that is like if we can get it 60 percent right before you even touch the code you know, to have authentication and, and all these different things baked in, then really all you have to focus on is business logic. And so, again, uh, when we're arguing or you know, negotiating um, with somebody on what we should spend our time on, it really comes down to, like, this is the most important thing. And again, like when when they see their application respond faster, when they see um, their uptime, you know, at a nine or whatever, that I think is measurable. You mentioned a book uh, that you liked. Are there any other kind of industry books that uh, that you have read or your yeah. you or your teams read? I mean, some things out there that you you find so interesting and relevant. The main thing I, I like about the books um, is that sometimes it injects language. You know, obviously yeah. there's, a, there's the Gervain Triven um, books and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's some leadership books like you know, like a Who Moved My Cheese and you know, um, you know, whatever, like Steering the Ship or you know, Change the Course, whatever. Um, I personally am more of a, a, a wiki, you know, podcast kind of person. You know, I, I think that um, there's some classic things out there. And again, like we want to get the vernacular out there. We want to be able to talk about things. And, you know, think about where Agile came from. It's like, hey, there's these sticky notes and we have Strom and you know, poker and all that stuff. Um, you know, like Jeff Atwood, you know, um, back before he kind of blew up uh, in the Stack Overflow game, he had a, a blog called Coding Hoarder coding horror and it was great you know it's just like little nuggets of wisdom you know scott hanselman and things like that where um it's real life kind of things hitting you is coding um, horror still out there because your jeff atwood stuff was amazing back in the yeah, day yeah well and he and, he is at stack overflow isn't he 
Yeah, he was one of the founders, I think. I, I think you're right. I, I, I think he, you know, like again, like you know, you invent the the pet rock or whatever type thing. Like you just, he just came. You know, it was the right thing at the right time. You know, well, his little. Have... It, the, I remember the uh, the coding horror logo. Yeah, um, which was like uh, from a book or or, or yeah. something. I can't remember the details, but yeah, that was that was a great place, great resource. Yeah, I mean, one of my most cited things from him was reusability. You know, mm-hmm. going back to the whole gold plating, like, you know, are you going too much? Is it you know uh, mm-hmm. minimally viable thing that better off? And he talks about reusability, um, requiring three instances. Like uh, you make something, and you're like, well, this is the new standard. Everyone should use it. And so you actually built a lot of stuff in there designed around user reusability. But honestly, unless you like go out and you like promote this thing that you did, no one's going to reuse it because they don't even know about it, you know? So then you say, okay, I have two. I'm going to effectively, you know, uh, partner with somebody and we're both using it. And it's like, okay, but you're both on the payroll team. You're both on the HR team. The, the other domains, the subdomains have completely different needs as far as data access or just something that's just not going to work. So again, you made something reusable that's not fully reusable. And you know, he kind of you know hashed it out. And I, I've used that many times to say, you come to me and you show me two other teams that you've reached out to who are willing to adopt this in the first three months, then I'm going to believe it's worth reusing. If not, you're a smart person, but let's build something for what you need and, and focus on reusability at a, a, you know, a different level, you know? So true. So true. Well, listen, I I've already probably taken too much of your time, but before I let you go, maybe let's, let's wind down like we have with many other episodes, just kind of looking forward, you know, to kind of some things that, you know, whether it's at Paycor or personally, whatever it is that, that you're kind of looking forward to over the next six, 12, 18 months, yeah, I mean, personally, I, I have a son who's about to go into kindergarten. That's really exciting. It's, you know, effectively um, that next phase of life. So that's, that's really amazing to see. Um, professionally, you know, technology wise, you know, um, I think a lot of movements um, have been off of things becoming ubiquitous. You know, there was the idea of like the smartphone. Once everyone had a smartphone, you know, that enabled things like, you know, ride share to exist because everyone was able to, you know, GPS and map and, you know, mobile pay. Uh, there's things like, you know, cloud computing or whatever. And I, I think the ubiquity of um, the AI processing, the open AI stuff, it's going to be amazing to see effectively, you know, what that allows, you know, um, us, like anyone, we're trying to figure out, because, you know, you can do a lot of technology demos that look really cool. Um, I was actually in a um, conference recently, and the presenter was getting a little bit, like, frustrated. He's like, he kept showing all these things that, like, the different frameworks like Dolly could do, and no one was impressed. He's like, why aren't you impressed? And it's like, it's hard to be impressed anymore by what chat GPT, like, you know, can do. Um, so then it's like, okay, so the luster goes off of like, it can just do a bunch of cool stuff. You know, what problems are going to go away? You know, again, like, you know, uh, the ride share thing and things like that, like you just, it, it made something possible that wasn't possible anymore. Um, and, and, and so I'm, I don't know, like there's some, again, pet projects that we're working on and things like that, but what is going to be that, you know, that watershed? Oh my goodness. Um, event or whatever you know I, I do laugh at the whole well it's going to write all the code for you like um you know if you guys haven't used it um it definitely will write a, a block of code for you it, it will definitely you know stub something out for you you probably don't want to ship a production but it is definitely there between that and like um github copilot and things like that amazing um but again you know what i'm really interested to see is is what are they going to be these like you know um society level changes that are going to come out of this that are, are more than you know, oh look, I put your face on, uh, you know, a picture kind of thing. So. Yeah, and and I, I I agree with you. It's it's been it's been a fascinating six months in technology, hasn't it? I mean, you know, the the amount of time we've been spending talking about um, large language models and generative AI and all this stuff is just, I mean, hockey sticked recently. Um, but it is. You're right. I mean, there are so many neat possibilities. I don't know that. And I don't know that, that the matter has been settled or it's all been figured out, but it is certainly going to transform our industry, um, you know, our, our work, et cetera, et cetera, soon. So, yeah. well, Adam, uh, it has been great chatting with you. I think it's one of those things we could probably talk for uh, for quite a bit longer, uh, but I want to be respectful of your time. Mm-hmm. So, again, thank you so much for joining Big Ideas and App Architecture. Um, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to speak again soon. Thank you. It was really fun. Thank you, man.